Uh, welcome, everybody. I am Michael from the Marxist Education Project, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you to this special day of Victor sharing the work of his mother and the life of his mother with all of us. Uh, as I was saying a few minutes before, when some of you were coming in, we, this is our very first art exhibit at the Marxist Education Pro Project, and certainly one of the few uh, online uh, gallery exhibits that one will see, I think. We will be having another one of these a week from Sunday on, on the 5th. Uh, Zoe Beloff, who spent four years doing paintings uh, on the rise of the right in the U.S., has done a 19-foot-wide accordion-fold book based on Brecht's poem, Parade of the Old New, that will also be an exhibit with explication uh, just a few days from now. Uh, but I want to give the floor over, the Zoom floor over to Victor to begin talking about his mother, Diane Esmond. Uh, Victor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Michael. And it's such a pleasure to see all of you here. And uh, this is for me an, an extremely special event in the sense that it brings together different dimensions of my life and the, the whole story of my mother, uh, her career, and then how I developed and how we ended up uh, with this being the first Zoom presentation about her. Uh, it's kind of improbable in terms of her life, but uh, part of her life was uh, bringing me into the world. And so we have the, uh, the two strands in a way coming together here in ways that we'll talk about, which I think makes this a kind of fascinating event. And for me, it's a process of bringing together different strands of my life, which up to now have to some extent been kept apart from one another. And I, I really have to underscore my gratitude to Michael for organizing this event, for suggesting it in the first place, because the way I, I had not thought of asking the Marxist Education Project to sponsor an event about my mother, but we got into a conversation the last time I made a presentation here which was for my book, Socialist Practice, uh, last May. And just when we were talking informally before or after, uh, I mentioned that I was now, having finished three books, I was really ready to concentrate on bringing world attention to the work of my mother. You know, she died now 40 years ago, but she always felt, especially at the end of, the, of her life, that she hadn't been adequately recognized. And so it has now become very a pressing uh, task for me, a, a, a pressing sense of, of obligation to get her to be better known. And so uh, when Michael saw her works as represented on her website, uh, he was so impressed that he, he asked me to, he suggested that I give a presentation here and, and I leapt at the opportunity. It's a, it's a wonderful occasion. And I think we'll, we'll talk about, there are some ironies involved, obviously, in terms of uh, where my mother came from, but it's, it's not entirely ironic. I think there's a certain appropriateness, as we'll see at the end. So, so what I want to do now is I want to share the screen and start to present about, about my mother's life. So Diane Esmond was born in 1910. Although her family's home was in Paris, she was born in London. Her father, Edward Esmond, born Edward Ezra, my grandfather, identified with the British Empire. He had been born and raised in India, descended from a long line of Jewish merchants, which two generations earlier had moved there from Baghdad. My mother's mother, Valentine, my grandmother, was the daughter of a daughter French of a British British entrepreneur, can you hear me? Uh, who in partnership with his brother was one of the major European 
pioneers of, of the oil industry. This is the iconic picture of my mother that you've seen on the announcements. And this is the great picture that I always come back to, which we'll come back to again at the end, which I can never tire of looking at, the tropical forest. But to go with my presentation, this is her father and mother, Valentin and Edward, at the time of their engagement. And I should mention, just to uh, be clear, that my, mo my mother, her nationality, her formal nationality remained British uh, because of her birth and also her, her father. And, and in fact, in those days, the mother also became British uh, just by virtue of marrying a, a British citizen. Um, but my mother always uh, lived in France, except for the time that when she was in the United States, when she was briefly an American citizen, but she let that lapse. So, she, uh, and I should also men mention that my mother was, I would say, perfectly bilingual between English and French. And um, I was uh, English uh, language preference for, uh, from the beginning for reasons which we'll also go into. Um, but she, she taught me French and some of our correspondence was in French and uh, all her notes to herself, let's say about her work were, were in French. Anyway, to continue, uh, she was the second of three sisters and here's a terrific family portrait uh, where you see, uh, actually the explanation is a bit covered up so I'll tell you, her father and mother uh, are on the left in the picture um, and behind them is her older sister, Sybil, and Diana is the middle one in the front, and to her left is her younger sister, Lulu. But this was taken in 1929, a family photo with some other relatives of her mother uh, there as well. So uh, this is quite a special document to me. Oops, uh, sorry, went forward. So, she was the second of three sisters. Uh, they were educated essentially by private tutors. I don't know when Diane began to think of herself as an artist, but I have the sense that it was an early childhood. She differed from her sisters in being less attuned to the social aspirations instilled at that time in the daughters of the bourgeoisie. She partly pursued goals of a kind that her father would have hoped to see achieved by a son like winning the girls' golf championship, the picture here, uh, in Britain at the age of 16. She was also the last of the sisters to marry, and unlike her sisters, uh, deliberately chose her husband, my father, Robert Valish, whose occupation, that of a doctor, was defined by something other than finance. So here are my parents a few months before I was born. The most vivid thing I remember Diane telling me about her childhood was of her father, who had fought in the British Empire in South Africa in 1898, holding her high up above his head and telling her to proclaim, I'm a big, brave soldier boy, for which she would be rewarded each time with a succulent dried apricot. After her death, I found a copy of a book of poetry that she had inscribed to her father in 1942 with the words, from your disciple and only son. What I wish I could have known is what it was that inspired her to choose that particular collection to give him. It was the complete poetical works of the poet most loved by Marx and perhaps the most revolutionary of all English poets. Percy Bysshe Shelley. And to illustrate that, I just want to read briefly uh, from one of Shelley's great poems, which uh, is in this pile somewhere. I almost know it by heart. Men of England, wherefore plow for the lords who lay ye low? Wherefore weave with toil and care the rich robes your tyrants wear? Wherefore feed and clothe and save from the cradle to the grave, those ungrateful drones who would drain your sweat, nay, drink your blood. And then later on the poem, see, I haven't found it, but I know it. The seed ye sow, another reaps. The wealth ye find, another keeps. The robes ye weave, another wears. The arms ye forge, 
another bears. Sow seed, but let no tyrant reap. Weave wealth, let no... Oh, here we go. Yes, the last one I'm going to say, I'm going to read. Sow seed, but let no tyrant reap. Find wealth, let no imposter heap. Weave robes, let not the idle wear. Forge arms in your defense to bear. So that's, that's one of the works. I don't know if my mother knew that particular work, but she chose the works of the poet who penned that, and that was what she gave her father. So... I ask myself about this tribute to Shelley uh, in her inscription in the book, because although my mother always respected me, she nonetheless was, if anything, alarmed by my leftist convictions, which were already strong by the time I was 16. But I could see, even without probing her taste for Shelley, that while she shunned political debate, she was able to extend herself humanly in a manner that transcended the limitations of her class origins. The broad human sympathy showed itself already in the subjects of her early paintings. And this is a painting from about 1935, which the, uh, it's, you can see that it's a little bit uh, damaged and that's because of the conditions uh, it went through, uh, which I'll explain in the moment uh, as a result of the uh, German occupation of Paris but it's one of the few that was retained and there are a few others from that period as well. So I can only guess at what she might've thought about the popular front, which formed a coalition government in France in 1936, but the men in, in, a, in a cafe shown here that she painted around that time must surely have been among its supporters. Her subjects in that period also included performing artists of various kinds, especially dancers and clowns. Various circus performers here, that there's a, here's the, the monkey that goes with this uh, performer you can see right here. Um, and uh, in, including some with, with, with African traits, which I'm sure, uh, outraged the, the Nazis along with everything else. Uh, <clears throat> so, and her paintings uh, of, of, of these people were shown at the time in a number of group exhibitions in Paris. But her work was interrupted first by my birth. This is, this is me. And then by the Nazi invasion of France. All her paintings from the 1930s were left behind when we fled the German occupation. I still a toddler in, the early, 19, in early 1940. As I learned only recently, the, the paintings were seized by the Nazis and held by them for a time in the Jeux de Paume Museum in Paris. According to the Nazis' own records, most of the works were then destroyed. And you can see this is the, uh, from the Nazis' records, and here's the, the key German term, vernichtet, uh, to, which is literally, uh, and ane, they put aneanti, the French equivalent, which literally means annihilated, uh, and a whole list of, of the works with her, her name next to different subjects. So, so most of them were, were destroyed, but a few, including the ones I just show, I showed you a moment ago, were rescued from a train headed for Germany around the time of the liberation of Paris in 1944. And here's a, just a certificate of their return of those of eight canvases uh, to, I, I think it's Madame Esma was probably my grandmother uh, to whom they were returned in 1946. Uh, but the big play, painting of the clown later hung for decades in my father's New York office uh, but it was only from recent research that I became aware of its wartime trajectory. One of the ironies of Diane Esmond's story is that the very erasure, for the most part, of her earlier period of creativity is what has, in the last few years, begun to bring her name before a wider public, as I have been contacted via the website 
by scholars in France and in Austria with an interest in learning about her career. Escaping from France by car through Spain and Portugal and by ship to New York, we, tra we, we traveled by car through Spain and Portugal and by ship to New York. This opened what was surely the most difficult period of Diane's life. And that, here's a photo from that period. In terms of her work, although, we got, uh, although she got a studio outside our home, she was not inspired. Aesthetically, she missed both Paris and rural France. And this is a studio photo from about that time, uh, which shows uh, one of the subjects in the background that she would draw in France and paint back in, in the US. It was not until she started making long trips back to France after 1945, culminating in her complete return to that country by 1956, that this uh, void of you know, missing Paris and rural France, that this void would begin to be filled. The New York years left a lasting imprint on her life. Her relationship with my father had always been an improbable one. He had represented a partial leap out of her social milieu, but their differences of temperament and commitment were insurmountable. The impact of all this was only amplified by the conditions of exile. She went through years of psychoanalysis, her liberation being finally achieved with her return to France, with her definitive move back to France. And this is a shot taken from the first place where she lived uh, after she moved back definitively. It was, a, it was literally a studio apartment. It was one, but it was a, on the top floor. It was a single, uh, apartment where she both lived and painted, but it was surrounded by this terrace that had this wonderful view of, of Paris. My brother Spencer was born in May 1942, and here's, here are the two of us. By Diane's own account, <clears throat> she never bonded with him in his infancy as closely as she had done with me. Of course, it was only many years later that she told me this, but its consequences were both immediate and enduring. This talk is about Diane and not about her children, but the fact that I alone am in a position to give it is a tragic outcome of Diane's exile and unhappiness. Spencer died by his own hand just a year after her death. So this is Spencer around the time he finished high school. And this is a later picture of him in his 30s. I should say a, just a bit more about my brother and myself insofar as this sheds light on our mother's life. Spencer and I were both from birth until the ages of six and 10, respectively, under the care of a living nanny. Oops, oops. A middle-aged English woman, a career nanny named Daisy Tucky. Uh, this explains why uh, English was definitely my first language. And of course I could, of course, also speak it with my mother. She had to make a special point of teaching me French when I turned five, because uh, my father, who, who was primarily French speaking, who was uh, French, uh, always wanted to speak English. And my mother would, uh, would criticize him for not speaking to me in French. So she had to make a special effort when I was starting when I was five to teach me French. But anyway, the, uh, more importantly, uh, the role of the nanny gave a special character to our interactions with our mother. And we responded in distinct ways. For Spencer, what was uppermost was to gain her loving attention of which he could never receive enough. For me, the outcome was in part to make me take a detached view of power relations in the household, which I perceived at the time as comprising an unfair disconnect 
between who did the most for us on a day-to-day -day basis and who would ultimately have the larger role in our lives. I have long seen my recognition of this class contradiction within our home as the first step in my political awakening. The contrast between my brother's life and mine continued to play out in later years. I put down roots in the United States and adapted to communicating with my mother for the greater part of, part of each year through a steady stream of letters. And I, I want to read a, a little bit from her letter. And it's, it's wonderful to see her handwriting there, uh, which, and I, I'm going to start uh, halfway down this one which was written from, uh, from an island in Italy in 1955. And she says, I'm just reading, starting halfway down. I only arrived this evening, so can't tell you what is in store for me. All I know is that it won't be easy because my work won't depend on what I see, but what I am. I have been through this so often. And in spite of me knowing all about it, it never changes. My feelings and thoughts and hopes change every minute. Hope and despair, passion and hate are all tearing themselves apart within me until I pull myself together and achieve what I think is worthwhile. And then another letter, which I think is one of the most important ones. It's one of, this is one of the very rare letters which she, in which she actually put the date uh, because normally she just wrote the day of the week. And so I later had to check the postmarks of the envelopes to find the dates of each letter. But this was dated on... September 16th, 1938, which was my 17th birthday. And so I'm, I'm going to read for this because this is perhaps the most significant letter about our relationship. She writes, and I start about halfway down. I can't help going back to September 16th, 1938. Then I felt very strongly what it was to be a mother. You were my first baby, and I adored you with a passion that only a mother can have for her child. You could not benefit for it. Later on, I had my worries and alas, you suffered silently. And I, and I failed to be the mother that I had hoped to be. It is no use for me to cry over spilt milk. Oh, it's a bit covered up. I have to look from the text. So I look at the happier side of life, such as our relationship now. You understand more or less my life, and I am torn between two countries. The one where my home should be, where you and Spencer and Papa are, and the country where I need to be, to be able to thrive, where I am myself, where my heart and soul go into my work. I have chosen Paris. I can't grow in New York. In doing this, I have failed as a mother, and you very sweetly tell me that it is replaced by a real friendship. Fortunately, you understand and accept this as well as you can. So, my sweet darling, let me tell you that at least if you have no mother, you have the greatest friend you could possibly have. A friendship which, even if you do not feel it, is full of the deep love of a mother. <clears throat> so, this, uh, in the, the correspondence uh, leads back to her story in France. And uh, she lived in Paris from 1956 to 62, enjoying a vibrant social life that brought her into contact with other artists, including people from the world of theater, no, notably Jean-Louis Barrault, Madeleine Renaud, and Marie Belle. This is, of course, Jean-Louis Barrault who was the major, not only a major French actor, but also the organizer that together with Madeleine Renaud, they, they, did, uh, uh, they, they were almost represented a French theater for, for decades. And Marie Bell also, who was a major uh, uh, performer um, and who, uh, for whom Diane designed stage sets and costumes uh, for several plays, including a 1963 Broadway production of, of the Racine's classic drama, uh, Berenice. These are, this is Marie Bell with the costumes uh, designed by my mother. In 1962, 
Diane married her second husband, Jean Don, a cartoonist who had worked for the commercial weekly Paris Match, and they moved into the small. They moved to the small village of Beust, about 30 kilometers west of Paris. They lived in a large 200-year-old stone house that would be her home until her death in 1981. The property also included a large stone carriage house, the upper floor of which became her studio. So now I, I want to show a lot of her, her paintings. And in this uh, part, uh, my remarks are somewhat informal, and uh, I encourage you to raise questions in the chat, which uh, Michael will, will keep track of. Um, Diane's post-war work differed markedly from her paintings of the 1930s. There were fewer depictions of people and more landscapes, buildings, and still lifes. At the beginning of this period, there was a move toward sharper contours, often with heavy dark lines separating different parts of the composition. Later though, the sharp delineation would recede and the landscapes would become more abstract. Um, I should say something also about the dimensions. Uh, I, I will call your attention to those paintings. That some of them were extremely uh, large. Th these are sort of medium sized, the ones I'm showing you right now. Um, but she painted an enormous variety of subjects. These are based on probably Italian uh, v visits that she made at the time. So, so I say a, a vital dimension of her creativity was her travels. She never painted on sight, but always did sketches, often with notes, which she would then take back to her studio to transform into paintings. Oops, this went too quickly. Um, I, I love this, this lute. I actually saw this lute, which was a subject of more than one painting. This is one of her still lives with the lute, an extraordinary uh, uh, instrument that obviously looks like a human face. And it appears again, although a little bit more uh, discreetly in, in this, um, in this painting as well, still life of the coffee grinder. Um, so among her travels, she made working trips to Venice, Vicenza and Ischia in Italy, to Southern France, and most importantly, to the Caribbean. She had gone to Haiti in the 1950s. This woman was from, inspired by her trip to Haiti and later went to Martinique and finally made several trips to the island of St. Lucia, where she m immersed herself most deeply in the tropical forest. So I'm just gonna show you a few of the paintings. There's a great variety in styles in this throughout. And it's difficult to place, I've tried to arrange them chronologically, but not all of them have dates, so it's been a bit difficult to do that. So this period, a lot of sort of geometrical design that comes in. And it's interesting that in her paintings of Paris, she took in the industrial sector of Eastern Paris, as in this picture, she painted many of barges on the Seine and I would say that as with this and with the case of the, of the lutes, she would often paint more than one fairly similar uh, painting of the same topic. And you can see some of the changes that she went through. So this begins to get into the tropical forest and the, uh, but the tropical forest, but also the landscape of Southern France, the Provence area, which I think may have inspired this one. Yeah, this is one which has a, a companion that I'll show you right afterwards. You can see, I, I don't know which of them came first. My guess is that this one came first and then, then this one. But, uh, but the, the palm tree at, on the left at the beginning was, should suggest their, their kinship. So 
So we'll go on through and show some more of these. This is a wonderful landscape from Provence. comes back to the circus theme. So b beginning in 1950, she had numerous exhibitions on both sides of the Atlantic, receiving favorable reviews, eliciting comparisons with notable impressionist and post-impressionist painters. And this is a little bit hard to read, but it, it's a, a review that compares her talent with that of the greatest. Um, that's uh, from the 1953 uh, French magazine, Art or Arts, uh, which says, uh, <clears throat> the expressive force, the vigorous use of color and the extraordinary soundness of composition of, the art, of this artist, whose talent is akin to that of the greatest. That's the, the phrase they have. And in a, another, a London commentator in the British on magazine Arts Review in June 1978, wrote of her tropical forest paintings, quote, you feel you're actually in the middle of these forests, but there is never any sense of oppression. And in the words of a London Times reviewer, quote, the combination of abstract harmonies and the impression left by actual landscapes is one of which the eye does not tire. So, and this is, uh, here she is at one of the, exhibitions in that period. Sorry. This is continuing into the 60s. As her sketch, uh, let's see, uh, what, what, so she had this extraordinary, well, success uh, in the sense of recognition by some, uh, some of the critics and, and, and fellow artists. What eluded her, however, was commercial success. Few of the works that she, that she showed found buyers. And I just want to mention this one. This is another one of, there are multiple uh, paintings of this kind of subject. And I'll just show one other with it, uh, where you can see how she experimented this on a similar theme. You go back and forth between these two. So why didn't she get so many buyers? I say, I attribute this to a combination of factors. Most fundamentally, she was not in sync with the mid 20th century art market, which tended to be experimental, favoring highly intellectual and or narrowly geometrical and or randomized or sensationalistic forms of expression. For better or for worse, and despite the friendships she had with certain individual artists, she worked for, for the most part in isolation from the general trends and controversies of her time. She was more appalled than intrigued. Sorry about that. She was more appalled than intrigued by the iconoclastic works that filled the showplaces of com contemporary graphic art. As her sketchbooks make clear, she hewed to an older ethic of tireless search for a certain harmony of expression, distilling the familiar while also seeking to bring it to a higher level. And this and the next two are examples of her really huge paintings. They're about seven feet wide and five feet high. And uh, I should remark that uh, my mother was a fairly diminutive stature, barely over five feet, but she would carry these around, put them up on her easels, and she, she was in complete control. It was not a problem. But um, so this, this is the, the yellow studio, it's a quite a remarkable uh, picture. And um, 
And this is the red studio. Those of you who've visited our house will see this one uh, in, in the entrance. <clears throat> so, but, so she distilled the familiar while seeking also to bring it to a higher level, certainly respecting complexity. The notes on her drawings would remind her of what she directly saw, but when she came to the canvas, she deployed the colors, often using a palette knife freely, imaginatively, often in surprising combinations, uh, yet with great care. So this is the third of the, of the really huge ones, in addition to the one I showed you at the beginning that we'll come back to at the end. All this could result in superb paintings, but was not enough to gain Diane Esmond wide recognition. Her relative marginalization from the contemporary art scene reflects also her distaste for any form of self-promotion, partly as a woman in those years, but also in terms of her temperament, which was not that of a performer. She could not imagine herself as a public figure. This in the next couple, by the way, of pictures are smaller and they're, they're gouache, which is a kind of watercolor with a, a substance to make it opaque. Um, she could not her, imagine herself as a public figure insofar as her earlier life had cast her, <clears throat> had cast her into the spotlight. It was for pursuits, not only golf, but also horse racing that flowed from her social background and had nothing to do with her artistic vocation. She was in the awkward position of wanting to become known for who she really was, as expressed in her art, but of having personal baggage, which in the framing it would likely receive at the hands of critics would tend to trivialize her accomplishment. These are a couple of the ink drawings. Another gouache, another tropical forest painting many tropical forest paintings and later in her, wait, so, excuse me, includes quite a few of this, with this orange canvas background. And then later uh, towards the end, these very dark uh, depictions. Again, she, she did several of these, both in oils and, and in gouache. After Diane died, the works she left were placed in storage in a Paris suburb. It was not until I was fully settled in the Boston area in 1994 that I was in a position, together with my life partner Inez Hedges, to take charge of them. And I should mention in this connection, I, this is a moment when I should publicly acknowledge the extraordinary work that Inez has done to help me bring this uh, to public attention. Uh, I mean, not, not only uh, in arranging and cataloging and placing the paintings and advising me at every stage of the process, also supervising the creation of the website for which I have Lara Bonventre to thank. Uh, she was the, the direct uh, website person, but, but Inez did in, incomparable help at, at every stage, often take the, taking the initiative and research. And I really want to recognize that uh, in front of everybody. Um, but in any way, um, so we got the, um, uh, uh, finally at this point, we, we got all the paintings. Uh, they were shipped in a huge container to our home in Somerville, Massachusetts in 1995. Many of them now grace our walls, but an even greater number sit in our climate controlled basement. Although we held a party to celebrate their arrival it was years before I found the time and the opportunity to make them more widely known. I, before we go on to the rest of the story, I come back to this uh, marvelous tropical forest painting, which we also have in our home. Again, about seven feet wide and five feet high. And, I, and it, it appears in different at every time of day. And it, it's like the, the actual forest in a way for me. Anyway, but in my efforts to make my mother's work known, I owe a major breakthrough to my having joined the faculty of the Berklee College of Music, which I joined in 1996, 
where I became part of a big department that embraces all the non-music disciplines, including, of course, art history. Another irony in terms of getting recognition for my mother is that it was thanks to my political education efforts among my colleagues that I became acquainted with the department's senior art historian, Henry Tate, who had inspired decades of music students with his enthusiastic presentation of the canon of the visual arts. After years of casual interaction with Henry, I was able to persuade him that a visit to our house to see my mother's paintings might be worth his professional time. When he finally did show up, he was bowled over by their quality and immediately offered to curate an exhibit of them at Berkeley. For the whole of the following academic year, I had the distinct pleasure of seeing more than a dozen of my mother's works in the lobby outside our departmental offices. The show was inaugurated on September 26, 2013. This is the publicity that Henry uh, arranged to announce the, the show with a copy of that Provencal landscape with an event which, uh, at which Henry and three other art history colleagues lectured briefly on Diane Esmond's paintings and ink drawings. The filming of this event uh, done by Lara Bonventre and uh, the film directed by Inez Hedges sparks the creation of the Diane Esmond website, uh, which you can find is just dianesmond.com, where the video of the talks, these three talks, is posted on the page that's called Retrospective, and a full in photo inventory of Diane's works appears under the, on the page called Art Gallery. The ensuing steps of Diane, in Diane Esmond's trajectory are now being written. Two years ago began the contacts that enabled us to add the page on Nazi plunder to her website. And now with the present event, Diane is engaging a core audience of radicals that she could not have imagined seeking, but which I trust she would have grown to welcome. As we have seen, a politics rooted in popular aspirations and solidarity is not foreign to her basic impulses. Her human outreach, even if she didn't articulate it as such, represented a step away from her bourgeois background. Beyond this, and in a way that she could not have foreseen, her depiction of the tropical forest in capturing its glowing essence may help deepen people's appreciation of the vital mix of species life that we must fight to preserve. So this is really what I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, these are the points that I think it all comes together in this, this wonderful painting. And this, my mother, as she appeared towards the end of her life. And I would love to have some conversation now about the whole question of art and what it can do for us. And also, I mean, the, the, the whole thing of my relationship to my mother and what this means and how my own evolution reflects to some extent her, uh, her evolution that I owe some, something to her in, in that sense that although she didn't actively encourage my uh, political work, she never questioned its uh, legitimacy and she did have sort of the basic impulses which I think are uh, consistent with, with what I've tried to live myself. So that's, that's the end of my slideshow. And I, what I want to do now is I, I'm going to end the this, this screen sharing and keep this wonderful image in your mind and go back to a conversation with all of you about any aspect of what we've been talking about here. Thank you, Victor. So, Thank you. There, Victor, there is one question uh, already, but that's been typed out from Valentin. Uh, yep. You can see that in chat. Okay, let me find the chat. Okay. 
did she think of any particular artists as inspirations? Well, yeah, she she, she loved uh, uh, all the impressionists and post impressionists. She loved Cezanne. She loved Matisse. She she loved uh, she, she loved Bonnard, um, Dufy, uh, Rouault. Um, Did you ever mention Kandinsky? No, she never mentioned Kandinsky. Oh, I, not, not to me like, anyway. She may have to other people. No. Uh, maybe those sparkling colors might be reminiscent a bit of Kandinsky. That's true. But, so I, so I, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, wow. Oh, I have another question. Yes. I have a comment, actually, because... Um, I think that there were some prejudice, you know, about her so-called marginalization. Yeah. Um, I think there were some prejudices vis-a-vis -vis, uh, women artists um, uh -huh. that might help explain um, the lack of recognition that, that she received at her time. You know, um, when I was in London several years ago, um, it was either at the Tate, Tate Modern or at um, the Barbican, there was an incredible exhibit of the work of Lee Kessner. The, um, the wife of uh, um, Jackson Pollock. Yeah. I had no idea of how incredibly talented she was. Mm -hmm. And this was, I believe, the first time that there was this you know, big exhibit of her work, at least in, in, in London. And so that might have something to do with the lack of recognition. Um, Victor, I don't know how you and others might feel about that. Yeah, well, yeah, I'd, I'd like to get other, other comments as well. I mean, this is this is a, a general problem that that, that women are uh, under recognized, and uh, my mother certainly grew grew up in that uh, in that framework. So it was already a a, a big step uh, on her part, even to uh, well to to begin to take the vocation seriously and as as a major commitment. It was a, a it, it was in some sense a it was a partial rejection of her background as I as I see it and I, I would again also mention I see in, in the chat uh, one of my friends has asked uh, about her inscribing the book uh, to her father from her, own, her his only son um, and that again uh, the she was they went to London for her to be born because he wanted to have a, a, a son who was British and they didn't know it that in those days in advance, the, the sex of the, of the baby. And uh, that was a, a major thing. I mean, and that in a way, his treating her that way and encouraging her, especially in the sport, uh, distinguished her uh, from her two sisters who uh, ended up in a more traditional female role. So, Perhaps that slight uh, tweak, you might say, in the gender dimension uh, helped get her out of the uh, situation. But I, I would say, though, that uh, nonetheless, she was uh, very um, uh, reserved in a way. I, I, I would, I'm and thinking of those uh, friends in Paris that, that I mentioned. Uh, I remember one time when I was visiting her and she had several of them over for dinner. And she would be mostly just sitting there and listening to them talk. She, she, she uh, I mean, she had very strong um, tastes, obviously, but she, she was not someone to uh, in, impose herself on other people or, or to, to come forward or to, to she, she was not a sh uh, someone who made a show of things. Uh, I don't know how else to put it. And, and, I, and I do think that that's to some extent um, a reflection of the uh, limitations on on uh, what was expected and considered proper on the part of women. I mean, in other words, she didn't completely get away from the uh, the stereotypical uh, view of of uh, of what women were supposed to be doing. So, so in a sense, her feeling so bad about failing as a mother, as she put it, uh, is is part of that. It's complicated, indeed. Uh, Victor, uh, uh, Carl Martin has two thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, Victor. Uh, I know Victor as a uh, as a fellow 
editorial staff member for Socialism and Democracy. And, um, and Victor, I really love this presentation. It, it speaks to your own multidimensionality, which I greatly admire. Um, my thoughts are, um, on the one hand, I'm incredibly impressed with the range of styles. Um, it's almost bewildering to think about these transitions from what look like quasi-cubist paintings to um, abstract paintings um, to um, more, uh, you know, still abstract, but more realistic landscapes. Um, but I wanted to mention how uh, fluid and um, active the, the human figures are, um, going all the way back to that cafe scene with the the, the back of the man and the kind of the curve of, of his, you know, body and the, and the elongation of fingers. And that was incredibly uh, enticing, as were some of those images of uh, what appear to be Caribbean figures. So just that fluidity is something that stood out to me. Um, my question for you is, how are you planning to deal with the materiality of all of these paintings in your home? That, that seems like an incredible burden. Uh, where will they go? How do they, how are they kept safe? What, what is your sense of, of where they might um, pass on to? Yeah. Well, that's the, the big challenge. The big question really, I mean, where they are now uh, uh, in our basement, uh, we do uh, And again, thanks to Inez's great care. Uh, we have uh, a, humidifier in the winter and a dehumidifier in the summer to try and keep a constant humidity uh, so that they don't deteriorate physically uh, while they're in that space. But the question of getting them out is what this uh, whole effort of mine now is, is partly intended to, to do, to get her to be known, to get there to be more conversation, more buzz about her. And uh, I mean, I've, I've started writing to galleries, museums, and so on, and the response has been uh, very disappointing. I mean, they don't even respond to my letters. Uh, I mean, I sent, we produced a very nice brochure with some uh, depictions of her, of her paintings and uh, some basic background information, which I enclosed along with a letter. And, and I, I sent it to 18 different places. They didn't even respond, uh, let alone uh, expressing uh, interest. So, uh, so I, we have to stay, take a step further. It's, and it, it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. I, I, and I, it's a question I wish I knew the answer to. And I, my hope now is that with more and more people knowing about it, eventually the, the, the word will filter out, uh, and, uh, and some, uh, interest will be built up, but I, I don't know quite what to do about it. And this is something I, I what I, I haven't yet got into the whole uh, th thing of the, uh, interest on the part of various Jewish museums because of her having been, uh, her work having been the subject of the Nazi plunder. That seems to have aroused a little bit of additional interest, a kind of interest which uh, is not exactly what she would have uh, uh, sought. But, uh, but uh, as far as I can see, anything that to arouse the initial interest is, what's, uh, is what we need to think of first and then think of, of uh, trying to impress people really with the with the sheer quality of it. I mean, she, that's what she really is looking for, but, but who knows what, uh, what can be the, the process. It's a, it's a complicated issue and very difficult. I mean, it's uh, my only uh, sense of, of it being perhaps a, a little less difficult now than it was during her lifetime is that I, I think there's in some sense a reversion of, of interest in, in just uh, paintings that people can enjoy as opposed to being uh, intellectual uh, uh, figments or intellectual artifacts uh, based on uh, some kind of, uh, well, what's known as conceptual art. I mean, my mother's art was, was I mean, she had ideas behind it, but it was not conceptual art as such, which, uh, which doesn't in, even in, in many cases involve uh, drawing or painting at all. Uh, so, so there is still a need for that. And then plus the, the point that I mentioned at the end in connection with the tropical forest about the, the sheer significance of having a, a representation, a, a, a depiction of this extraordinary wealth of, of, of natural beauty, which is uh, th threatened uh, severely at the present time. Victor Mark uh, Mazarovsky, who you seem to have quite a bit in common with, has made two 
chat comments and Mark, would you like to speak to those? Sure. Um, I really enjoyed this lecture, by the way, and it was a, I always enjoy seeing the, uh, the artwork, uh, so to speak, in the flesh, in the full colors, because after seeing all these black and white photographs coming out of the Nazi period, um, it gets a little tedious. Mm -hmm. So thank you for showing them. Um, I, w I made two comments. One is about the jeu de paume. Um, and I think I told you this a number of times before, but uh, there's no absolute incontrovertible evidence that everything was destroyed. So there mm -hmm. is likelihood that things have survived. And uh, the reason why I say this is, for instance, uh, the paintings of Fedor Lowenstein popped up magically um, uh, several, uh, I think about 10, 15 years ago, the French government found them and they were supposed to have been destroyed in 1943 and they found them in a closet uh, somewhere in the basement of uh, the Modern Art Museum in Paris. So I'm not saying to, to hold out for hope, but there is that big question mark as to what exactly did happen on that fateful day in uh, July 1943. So that's mm -hmm. one comment. The other comment is just personal. I grew up in a family of artists and my mother was a painter and my father was a graphic artist. And she, like my father, suffered greatly in, uh, in the Paris art market um, because she was essentially shunned uh, by all the sort of male, uh, largely male um, art dealers, collectors, and, um, and curators in museums. And it took really a tremendous amount of energy for her to even get uh, the kind of exposure that she wanted, but uh, it always fell short. And there was a clear, I can attest to it, I mean, since I grew up there, um, there was an absolutely explicit bias. And the only, and I'm not, it's not to disparage the women artists who, who did succeed, but uh, some of them, you know, like Joan Mitchell, were very wealthy at the time. And that was sort of appealing to some of these uh, French dealers because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, exotic American women coming to Paris. Um, but women like my mother, who were quite poor, were not exactly uh, on the top of the list. And I'm not saying it's just a, it's not a moaning session, but it's just to confirm that um, that uh, your mother wasn't alone in this uh, in this department. Mm -hmm. And an interesting detail for me is that your mother and my mother painted with a palette knife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that was really a, a nice detail. So yeah. Yeah, it's especially apparent in that tropical forest one because it yeah. were really thick uh, daubs of paint that, that, that made possible, it makes it almost almost three-dimensional, yeah. And it's funny that you mentioned the uh, the artists that uh, that she liked because you could definitely see tonalities, you know, themes that re to me were reminiscent of Matisse, of Cezanne, and other artists from, uh, you know, from the late 19th, early 20th century. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. definitely internalized them, especially yeah. the colors. Yeah. And the shapes. Yeah, great. Thank you for those comments, Mark. I really appreciate your work, your interest. I'd like to make a comment. This is Noel. Um, I was really moved by the art when I visited uh, Victor's house, and something about like the uh, work that Victor does. Some part of his life is all around prisons and prisoners and prison work. It's very important for me to have as much art around and also be deeply moved by art, even though it's difficult, because when you're surrounded by the, the actual work on the ground with people who are in, on death row or in solitary or listening to people call from prison, you just have to have that level of vibrancy. Um, so I thought that I was just blown away the first time I visited his house. I was like, holy Christmas, every single wall is just something you could stand before for hours. Um, so, and I, I have deeply appreciated that kind of sensibility and try and bring it into my work as the little tiny bits that I can. Oh, thank you for those comments, Noel. And I, I would, yeah, I'm very glad you brought up the relationship uh, connection with prisoners, uh, partly also because I mean, two of the prisoners I correspond with are themselves artists. And uh, I know that others, of course, Leonard Peltier is well known to be a, as an artist. And especially the, the other thing is in terms of the correspondence, because nowadays when 
the whole population is goes to phoning and emailing and texting and so on. Uh, the one reliable sector of the population with whom one is thrown back into the old way of communicating is prisoners. And so I, I sometimes think that my experience in writing letters back and forth to prisoners, much of which I do by, by handwriting, just to get away from the computer screen, uh, I was well prepared for in my many years of of long letters to and from uh, my mother. It's, it's an ironic link there. I'm looking at the at the uh, chat. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, you, you have a better view of the chat than I do, and I see John John I, Saul. I, I, I don't know if Carol Seligman saw that. I asked if she would like to speak. She wrote. Yeah, uh, I see. Yeah. Um, Carol, would you like to comment? Um. Well, I could just say what I said in the chat. Should I do that? Sure. 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 <laughs> that'll, that'll preserve it better. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, I just um, think that many art galleries, probably most, it's kind of shocking that they don't answer your your communication, Victor, but I think they're into – money making and trends and uh not necessarily gorgeous artwork and her work is gorgeous i'm blown away by the what i saw on her slideshow um and i several of the of the pieces reminded me very much of cezanne matisse and the drawing reminded me a little of clay Mm -hmm. um, and I just uh, hope that as you record this, it's going to be available because I missed the first part. Um, also, I don't think there's any doubt that the sexism in the uh, official art world played a huge role in, in uh, denying her the recognition she should have had because this work is fantastic. That's all I needed to say. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, uh, John, you had your hand up. John Saul. Yeah. Uh, I recall uh, uh, seeing some works of hers that I thought of being small when I, when I visited in New York a very, very, very long time. Did she start making the very large paintings when she got back to France or the earlier ones smaller? That was Curious yeah, the, the, the really large ones she made uh, definitely all after she was back in France, although she, there were some medium sized ones that she did in New York. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Victor. Yeah. Uh, is there a way that you could share a screen and quickly go through the painting oh, section again? Because a fair number of people here came after you showed the. Yeah. Slides and I think that like when I'm in galleries, I will return to a, a room to look at something again. And this might be a good time to just show us again those sure paintings. Uh, okay, I'll 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 go through them fairly s slowly. And if you can keep uh, everyone unmuted so people can sort of uh, comment or question. I'll unmute and, every. I'll go through and unmute as, as, as we go. Oh, along. I can't. They everyone has to unmute themselves. I see. Yeah. But I, I so I'll go back to screen sharing and I'll I'll go I'll pause just on the paintings and and not on the other things. And I'll uh, I pause for a few seconds on each one. Sure. Okay. Here we go. Oh my gosh. I don't know how to go back to the beginning, but God, just outstanding. Going backwards, uh, let's start trying to go through. In it's so fast! It's so fast. No, 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 no! I'm, I'm going back to the beginning, and then I, now. Oh, now, oh, okay. I wanted, to, I wanted to do it in sequence. 
So, so we'll, we'll have the ones from the 30s. Okay, here, here's where we start. You don't have to read the poem again, but it, it's great <laughs> that you do it, Victor. Yeah, yeah. So, so th these are, this is, these are the, this and the next few are from the 1930s in, in yeah. Paris. And almost yeah. all of these can be seen on her website, uh, dianesmond.com. Uh, under the, if you click on gallery, uh, you'll find almost all of these. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Victor, where's the one of the men in the cafe? That, I, sh I just showed that a mi few minutes, uh, well, less than a few minutes. Uh, it was, you want to go back to that one? I I'd like to see that one, yeah. Okay. It, it, it'll, t it'll just take a couple of seconds. Da -da -da. There it is. Okay. Oh, there. Okay. And how were those series damaged? Why were they so good? I mean, why, yeah. Why was this series somewhat damaged? The paintings the, that that was in the course of the uh, uh, seizure by the Nazis, uh, and, and they, they were. And so we got this when we received this. It was all rolled up. It was not stretched out on a canvas. Most of the ones we got back. Um, I mean, uh, well, almost all the paintings I I have. We actually they came on the fully stretched out canvases. But this is what, this one was rolled up and so we unrolled it and you can still see the folds from that. Okay. Well, can, thank you. Can, I'll go on a little, get back up to where we were. What happened to the loot? Oh, we, we saw the loot. It was back here. That's the yeah. first no, no, I mean, what, what was the fate of the loot? The, the fate actor. of the loot? I, I'm sorry. I wish I knew. I, I, I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah. I, I always loved this one. Yeah. Mm. Gosh, your work is gorgeous. Mm. Those vivid colors. And just, no, oh my just gosh. And this one. One can meditate in front of this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Just outstanding. Yeah, this is the one they chose for the Berkeley publicity. Really good. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, wow. <clears throat> wow. That's great. Oh, <laughs> And the painting within the painting too. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh my God! Here, painting within the painting also. Another one, yes. Yep. Oi. This is, you can look at this for a long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know what. Uh... God, these colors. Oh. So this is a, again a tropical forest scene. Uh, this this one should have been placed up with the other two of the the jug there another a third variant of that besides um her her first husband what did her family think of her work Oh, uh, her, her mother was very encouraging. I mean, um, her mother lived, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure both her parents were. Her, my grandfather died when I was six, but uh, my grandmother lived until I was 30, and I knew her very well, and, and she was, uh, of course, enormously encouraging. Um, yeah, I mean, they, yeah, they were very supportive. You can all find all kinds of things in these. Oh, my, my, my. Victor, it's Tony. Can you hear me? Yes, Tony. Good. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together. It really, as I said in my note, inspiring, and we're going to make sure that the the artists and the spectators in our family all get a look at it. Uh, they can get a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was, I'm thinking about the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Yeah. And uh, we have a couple of friends who are related to that in some way and that might be a good venue for this and That's by the way uh wendell i'm not sure he was able to watch he thanked you again for one of the works and uh he i tr sent him the link but it may have been too late mm -hmm. yeah well i'm You'll really glad that you joined and yeah you know, thanks for that idea about the w museum yeah, yeah. They, I, I think, um, I mean, it, it's not Boston or New York, but what the heck, you know, uh, it might be a, a good start. And, and we do, we'll explore that. And if we find any good leads, we will share them with you. That is wonderful. I really appreciate that. In fact, that, that was one of the first places I went to uh, shortly after she died. Oh, and, mm. And, and they, they, but but it, I'm sure there's been a huge change since then. At that time it was unsuccessful. Yeah. There is, a, you know, a whole new day. Yeah. And uh, one of the things we have to do is learn how to seize the day. So we will yeah. uh, see if there's a way to do that. Yeah. Terrific. That's, that's really great. Victor, uh, Peter no. wants to know if your mother wrote any statements about her artwork. Uh, she never wrote for publication. That's, I think the closest thing to statements is what, what she wrote in her letters. No. But uh, that, that first letter I wrote is, is quite uh, 
a strong statement, you know, that it's not what I see, but what I am uh, that, that goes into the paintings. And not, not who I am, but what I am is, is how she put it. <clears throat> yeah, it, no, she, I, I, I think she would probably say that um, what she has to express, she expresses through the art and she, she'll talk about it informally, but uh, it, I don't think it ever occurred to her to write something for publication. There's a few more that we can still see as we go through these. <clears throat> you know, I, I, I thought of, um, I mean, I, I also sent a, um, um, a message about two possibilities. I was recently at the um, Phillips um, Gallery here in DC. And I think there's now a, um, more recently, a broader appreciation for, um, uh, you know, artists whose works were overlooked earlier on. And mm -hmm. I mentioned in my, um, my, my message here that, um, there, there's an ongoing exhibit at the Phillips Gallery of um, African-American artists, including this wonderful woman I'd never heard of before, but I was just floored by some of her work. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it is, as you said, uh, Victor, possibly um, a, new, a new era, a new dawn, maybe new curators who would be uh, more interested in, um, in your mother's work. Mm -hmm whether singly or as part of a broader um, exhibit. Great, great. That's terrific. I mean, well, it's, I'm sure the uh, chat is saved for you, Victor, so you can refer to notes like that. Yeah, I, I want to see the, all the chat, the whole chat. That'll be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be saved, definitely. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Good. Oh, I see that Mark and I have been in community. have <laughs> been in sort of communication with each other. We're on the same page. Oh, oh gosh. Yeah, you can see her instructions to herself. It's all in French. Oh, wait, yeah. Yeah. Writing the colors and whatnot. Yeah. Oh. I love that one. That's the the ultimate one. <laughs> I know. I know it well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. The letter uh, to you that she wrote and that you read to us was uh, so poignant and moving. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I think it made several of us emotional, and not just yeah, emotional. you know, and I, and I it's the uh, reading it many times. I I got emotional this time in a way that I hadn't before, just because I guess I was sharing it with so many people. Yeah, it's amazing because she felt that all very strongly, and yeah. uh, and I, I we did have a, I think quite a remarkable friendship. I mean, she told me. I remember, I'll never forget her telling me when I was nine years old <clears throat> that I could tell her anything and she would never get angry with me, whatever I, I would tell her. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. She told me that at one point. Mm -hmm. And there, in, in her letters, not among the one, there's occasional, occasional semi sarcastic point about my politics, but ah. nothing really. But, uh, but when I was uh, an adolescent and I first began expressing radical ideas, uh, my father was extremely uptight and upset about it. But uh, my mother, she wouldn't comment. And, and, and she, she didn't follow politics, really. It was not her sphere. Uh, but she sort of essentially defended my right to think what I wanted to think. I just wanted to mention what a pleasure it is to live among all these paintings mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Oh, well, Victor, can I ask a question? Sure. So when you would visit your mother, would she be painting? And if so, would you ever have discussions with mm -hmm. her about mm, the different stages of the work she was doing? And 
whether she would stop and was puzzled or if she would start one over because she got different ideas, these kinds of things that artists will sometimes share, not share, but maybe, did yeah. you have sharing moments on any of these paintings with your mom? Yeah, I mean, just in the sense that I, I did see some of the paintings uh, when they were half done, you know, so in the process of going on and and she would uh, talk about them a little bit. I mean, the, 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 the thing that uh, bothered me a bit was that whenever she was painting and she would pause to look at it and think about it, she would take out a cigarette and that was, <laughs> that was uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, w when she saw, started to show the the effects of that, I, I was upset by it. But uh, she said it was an integral part of her working. So there was no way she could do her work and not uh, have a cigarette while she was thinking about what to do next on a, on a painting. So that is as far as the process goes. I, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I know that in that stage in the, uh, where it was very geometrical, uh, she would uh, sketch out everything in pencil on the canvas itself uh, before she would fill it in with paint. I think later, uh, I, I doubt that she could have done that with, with, like with this painting that you're looking at now. There's no way that, she, that, that that could have been done, although it's possible that it might have been some broad contours uh, put, put in. But that, that was, that's the most I can say about her, uh, the, the process. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone was smoking in mid-century anyway. I'm just reading um, Jamie Bernstein's memoir of growing up with Daddy, um, Leonard Bernstein, and uh, she mentions his constant smoking, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, when he was composing, when he, whatever he was doing, it was, yeah, so. Yeah, it, it was uh, ironic. I mean, it was part of the creative process. It was, Evidently. Yeah, yeah, inseparable from it. Yeah. So. Beautiful work. Just, mm -hmm. um, oh gosh, thank you for this. Well, I, I, I appreciate it. And I, and I, I guess, you know, it, it, it may be interesting to think of the larger role that is played by this whole range of uh, types of expression in the political changes that we're all uh, recognizing, I think increasingly, uh, uh, whatever disagreements we might have about practice, uh, recognizing the urgency of some major change uh, to s block the kind of march to destruction that, that our species is engaged in. And um, the role of the arts in, in that whole process is something that is always um, a, a constant subject of, of reflection. But if anything like this can bring more people into um, a kind of consciousness and can help, let's say, broaden their consciousness uh, uh, help them recognize the value of what it is that that we have to preserve and and the, what the scope is of the things we have to do in order to preserve it all that is that's part of what i'm thinking about and part of the what comes together really for me in in producing this um, this event so any thoughts about you know, the larger question of art and politics and how this might uh, play a part is, it, it, Carl, uh, Carl has another question. Yeah. So, Victor, on the very point of ecological consciousness, did your mother enjoy rural France as a way to partake of farm life and the agricultural world? Was she a green thumb? Did she like plants? I'm just wondering if she absorbed in her daily activities uh, an ecological consciousness of her own kind. Yeah, well, she certainly has surrounded herself with plants. That that's true. I, I think, as far as rural fr France is concerned, this would go to maybe rural Italy also. Uh, I think what impressed her especially was the way the, that the structures uh, seemed to blend in with the landscape. They weren't eyesores sort of superimposed on it. They they blended in, yeah. and, and that was very impressive impressive to her. I wanted to mention that this culture often uh, puts a lot of pressure on women not to have a body of art and not to prioritize themselves or the, their own 
being. So whether or not she was recognized in her lifetime, mm -hmm. she was able to prioritize her own vision enough to create it and to leave it for us, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that part of the story is super important. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You know, if I hadn't believed in myself, I would never have done a certain thing or two. Mm -hmm. You know, the culture told me that I would never work. I would never be able to live. I would, you know, I wasn't a, as a working class person, I wasn't able to, understand that there was another possibility but I had to do something like you're an artist has to do something or someone who wants to bring to life a story right regardless of whether they survive or not mm -hmm. um, yeah. and so I feel like the power of that the fact that she was able to create her depth of her work was is very important and also um, if we touch into that then we can find the resistance the resistance to the other political pressures and the ability to be more part of the political solution, mm -hmm. which is our mandate. Our culture has to take on the issues that are going to um, suffocate it and each individual person, both as artists and part of that process. So the resistance and the fact that she was able to do what she did for me is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. <clears throat> hmm. maybe i'll stop the share so that uh, but you can find this uh, painting on her website uh, insofar as you can't see it uh, anyone who can visit us will see it directly but you can find it anytime on on the website but i'm going to stop share now so i can uh, see everybody again and um <clears throat> See if we have any any other uh, comments or reflections. Or... Uh, hey, Victor, you yeah. said, that in, uh, I forget what part of the write-up about how you have a lifelong interest in all creative arts, and I, I I'm not surprised that you do, based on growing up with your mother. Did you ever take up drawing or painting yourself? Not uh, really to any significant extent. I <clears throat> I did a few little drawings. I never did any painting, um, but uh, yeah, the, the study was important. One of the my great intellectual experiences was reading uh, two consecutive summers. I read it twice. Uh, Arnold Hauser's book, The Social History of Art, which is a, 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 gi a magnificent work that I recommend to anybody. I don't know what other languages it might be available in in English, Arnold Hauser, H-A-U-S-E-R, because um, that's what really uh, helped me at an early stage, because really, I read it right between, the, uh, uh, I guess, my second year of college or between college and graduate school. Um, it, it really brought together the worlds of, of, of art and uh, social history and uh, social change. And essentially making the argument that the that the greatest works of art, uh, in a sense, anticipated the the kinds of change that were going to be necessary and that people were going to bring about. That they gave, they, the artists were in advance of their time in relation to the, the social issues. And that was an interesting idea that I derived from that book. But there were so many. Uh, observations that he made about particular points it, and it dealt with the graphic arts and, and, and with uh, literature and drama, N not much with music. I try to sort of pick up in other ways, my understanding of the social history of music, which is a bit spotty, but uh, it's all extremely interesting. And, I, and of course, being at, at the Berkeley College of Music, I've been especially interested in social history of music at the present time, the, uh, the ways in which uh, musicians can tap into the forces for social change and help bring them out. And one of the things I've found in that respect, looking into it, is I, I'm, I was surprised by how much uh, radically critical sentiment I've found among musicians who have been very popular, uh, but I, and I somehow can't figure out how tens of millions of people could be listening to uh, uh, people, uh, uh, you know, some of these performers and not be uh, stimulated to become more, uh, more politically active. I'm thinking of, of uh, Tracy Chapman, for example, and, uh, 
you know, or even even uh, Bruce Springsteen to some extent, and uh, I mean, the, the, among the ones who really reach tens of millions of people, because they, they all have they have radical messages in a way, but but uh, it it doesn't translate into anything. So how does it how does it fit in? On the other hand, you have the the really uh, much more explicit and direct uh, performers and singers and songwriters like David Rovix, uh, whom I admire greatly, but his audience is fairly small. So, but but, and I, I suppose the one who maybe bridges the gap. Well, you had Phil Oakes in the 1960s, who who was my favorite uh, songwriter. But then on the other hand, well, you had Bob Dylan, who was the who was more celebrated. Uh, but who uh, who sort of kept at arm's length from the actual movements themselves. So uh, how all these sensibilities can come together to to forge a, a movement that'll uh, bring the great uh, variety of, of people and of, of popular interest together into some kind of common struggle with a, a kind of inspiration uh, that can be provided by the artistic expression. That's That's a great question and something that one can continuously strive to achieve. Just I see so many friends here. It's it's wonderful to see you all here and I I wish we could we could all each have a conversation and maybe um, if if you have some things to add here or or otherwise we could continue the conversation later. But I'm I'm really happy to see you all. Uh, so I just well, I, I just posted the link to um to the website if people yeah. want, want it. Oh yeah, right the the website for to see the the works. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. I was uh, I was pleased to see uh, some of the very old things and try to put the dates together. I must have met your mother in 1951, possibly 1952. Uh, it was in 1952 that she left, wasn't it? Well, she was she was starting to go. We're spending a lot of time over there each year, but she didn't really get her her place. That one that I showed the view from until 1956 so that's when i and i think before that she would go over and she would stay with her mother and uh, for a few months uh, and uh, and then come back so yeah. how, how did her parents survive the war well we that's we all came to the to the united states in 1940 and they were all with you okay yeah, right. right yeah it was i came with with her and with her parents and my father came a bit later but um, yeah, and my grandfather, unfortunately, he died just after the war ended, but before he had a chance to go back. But my grandmother went back and lived on for many years after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, Inez and I were at the um, Boston Fine Arts Museum the other day, and uh, one of the things we looked we looked at some modern art, and I was walking around looking at paintings and thinking that a lot of them really, I mean, your mother's paintings <laughs> would have added a lot. Yeah, right. You no, know? I mean they they deserve to be there more than several that I saw. Yes, right. <laughs> you no. Know? I've I've often had that feeling. Absolutely, yeah. I would refer to this as curatorial tyranny. Yeah, curatorial tyranny, right? Well, I mean, museums are really autocratic institutions, and um, and uh, it's you know I've don't even get me started. I mean, I had to put up with this for decades. You know, watching my parents and uh, you know getting their works, trying to get their works in museums, or not being able to get works in museums. It's always the same nonsense, um, and uh, and curators and museum directors have a tendency to be too uh, shackled to fashion, mm. and they oh. get very hypersensitive about their audience, what's going to make them happy, and that's why you've seen this belly flop, uh, you know, as a result of the Me Too movement, also the Black Lives Matter movement. All of a sudden, you know, they all these museums have grown a conscience, but. Um, it's 
to me, it's the, it's really unpleasant to watch all this. And there's no, it doesn't seem to be very genuine. And, you know, the, the feeling that I have is, uh, you know, as soon as something else pops up on the horizon, then, you know, they'll just set aside their brief flirtation with, uh, with doing the right thing with regards to unrecognized artists. So mm-hmm. it really requires pressure or it requires setting up alternative structures. And I've always been an uh, advocate of, of artists basically uh, working together, you know, with like-minded uh, folks in the art world to basically set up, um, you know, uh, a network which, basic, which doesn't require one to be so dependent on recognition by X or Y or Z museums. So I, you know, that's just my personal opinion. I mean, I'd love to hear more about that, the yeah. alternative structures for getting the artwork out. I mean, that's what I have to contend with my parents' work, so. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, whether there, you, we have museums and you have galleries and uh, what other, what variations on those can one think of as ways of, getting there are uh, you know there are projects popping up right and left not just in the united states but i mean in europe and in other countries uh, that seem to want to promote um, other artists um, and uh, those who never made it into the pantheon for whatever the reason and it doesn't you know you create your own pantheon in that case and uh, Mm -hmm. if that's even a, a workable concept but Diane's work, for instance, even though it would be, it should be a natural for the Jewish Museum of New York, it's not going to happen because mm-hmm. the Jewish Museum of New York is too, it's too, it's too caught up in the whole. Oh, I'm a museum in New York. I should be like MoMA and the Met and the Whitney and <clears throat> those other institutions. So there's all this pressure that's been created, you know, internally to mimic or to be uh, on par with instead of really um, focusing on the mission. I mean, the, the exhibit that's been at the Jewish Museum now for a while on uh, restituted works of art should have included your painting, your mother's paintings. There's no mm. question about it. But she doesn't, she doesn't even surface because they just think of Matisse, Van Gogh, Renoir, Monet, and, you know, uh, and the leading uh, uh, top flight uh, Jewish art dealers who were plundered. And that's really what the exhibit was about. So, um, you know, the only exception was the Lowenstein painting, but that's only under pressure from the French government. They sent this painting that was recently discovered in one of these closets. So Lowenstein, Esmond, and other like-minded artists should be actually grouped together and Mm. exhibited because they represent really what Paris was about in the Mm. interval period. And, Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always firmly held to that view and, uh, there are thousands of artists that were swept aside uh, for whatever the reasons and also for the politics of the time. So, mm-hmm. and did not get the recognition that they deserved, even though they were uh, active in Paris during the interwar period in other cities, exhibited, you know, they were supported by dealers and collectors alike. And, uh, and all that history just went got flushed down the toilet as a result of the war. Mm-hmm. And then the art market just, you know, preferred to engage in collective amnesia about it. Mm. Yeah. And that's really what we're fighting against. At least that's what I'm struggling against. Yeah. Trying yeah. to rehabilitate and, and rewrite the narrative. So it requires right. a certain type of revisionism, you know, regarding these artists. But a, the correct kind of revisionism is to mm-hmm. put them back where they belong. Right. Mm. That was my afternoon rant. Sorry. I see <clears throat> another thing on the, on the chat. Thank you, Mark. That was very interesting. And I, I hope it's something we can follow up on. <laughs> that would be a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Deirdre, would you like to ask your, make your statement? Deirdre, would you like to speak? Uh, you're muted. Well, Beth. I really don't have much to say other than my dark comment, but um, Victor knows, um, you know, would, would not be surprised at my comment. Um, as to the social uh, social history and social function of art. And the, the older I get, the more, um, should I say, uh, the more pessimistic I am about the role of the museum in the, the museum, largely speaking, you know, of, of in, in our culture. I started museums um, 
the Met, Art Institute, Cooper Hewitt, a couple others. Um, but the more I saw, the less I liked. <laughs> so I love to go and see the works, but I'm just as happy to go to galleries around and see what they've got that has not yet been um, discovered and posterized. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's about all I have to say. <laughs> Go, Victor. And, and I hope you find the place for these works where they, they can be um, appreciated and loved. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine them in many architectural settings where they would greatly enliven um, the, the um, otherwise sort of sterile um, appearance of many buildings and many structures and many institutions that we all interact with. That's about all. Yeah. <laughs> Little politics. Sorry, Victor. Sorry to Thank do you. that. <laughs> Thank you, Dadra. No, I appreciate that. That's great. Yeah. Hi, Victor and Inez. It's Marin Hi, and Hi, everybody Marin. else. Um, I, I just uh, got Inez's email yesterday and, and I couldn't join right at the beginning of this, but I joined in time to see your second run through of the painting. So that's good. Uh, and I'll look at the recording, but maybe you talked about this earlier, but um, I sort of want to, uh, well, first of all, I want to sort of put in a plug for curators for the most part. I mean, they're pretty overworked and underpaid and, you know, um, there are very few of them who can kind of <laughs> sit around and be kingmakers and go go to all the cocktail parties and so forth. But um, uh, and but along those lines, I mean, and maybe this is what maybe you, you talked about. Would would you be would you want your mother to be considered an American artist uh, or a French artist? I mean, I think that can be important. For instance, uh, uh, approaching you know the National Museum of the Women in the Arts, which I, I'm not sure if it's actually part of the Smithsonian, but it may have a certain American focus and so might some other places. And then the other thing is, um, you know, galleries have to sell work. I mean, that's how they, they stay afloat, whereas museums don't. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what you want as the ultimate fate of, of the paintings. And maybe you want to sell some of them and others you want to be kept somewhere in per perpetuity, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it might be good to think more about those things uh, if if you haven't already uh, in approaching the various you know sh uh, shadowy figures in the art world here and there. Yeah. Um, is your mother an American painter? Well, I, I think it would be almost impossible to call her an American painter. I mean, she. She lived here for you know maybe uh, ten to fifteen years on and off uh, after the first six years, um, and uh, but she never really identified. I mean, she she was a citizen for a while, but so and as I explained at the beginning, uh, yeah, she was uh, she was French, but yet not French because her official nationality was, was Brit British. So um, it, it's it's a bit uh, ambiguous. Yeah. And, in, in in that respect, but but I think she she def definitely regarded her home as as France, and so in in that sense, that's why we speak of her as a French artist on the on the website. Um, uh, but it, in in terms of what what I'm seeking, it's it's definitely to have her work known, and the more places it can be uh, di put on display where a lot of people see it, the better, and and that's that's much more important than anything of sales. And I see any possible sales merely as a a way of establishing a reputation for her so that, that selling a few of them could be helpful in creating a conversation and interest around it. And, and that's, uh, that, that's really the thing. I, I, incidentally, I, I just saw my niece who was on here earlier and had to leave, uh, sent me a, a link to a place where one of her paintings was posted uh, by a dealer uh, for uh, about almost 10 times the, the price that I, had, you, had, uh, that I usually saw placed with her paintings. So it's, it's very, uh, it seems like a volatile kind of situation. I don't know what to, what to charge. You, you don't want to charge so much that people can't afford it, but you don't want to charge so little that, that they think it's not uh, of, of value. And, it, and it's, it, it's really, this is one of the things that most disappoints me about this, uh, the conditions in which we have to operate on this, that, that it should depend on so much on, on financial calculus and, and uh, not on uh, really the uh, 
decision based on the merits of the of, of the works themselves. And I, I'm quite surprised that the I, I mean, like with the, the case of the Harvard Museum, where I gave them the, the brochure and told them about it and said, you can mm-hmm. come. No, they're not interested. So um, it's 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 something that has to be cracked. And I don't know how it's how it's going. Yeah, to well, I mean, don't worry. The dealer will tell you how much to charge. Because <laughs> <I mean, laughs> as you say, it's a completely financial calculus and they know all about it. But it's perfectly true, as, as someone was saying earlier. I mean, you can set up your own venue for showing the work and just publicize it very, uh, you know, che- well, re- hopefully fairly cheaply, but very uh, fully, you know, er- everywhere and people will come. I mean, that's how people start galleries. And, yeah. um, you know, you can, you can really do, yeah, pop-ups. That's what, someone, what Mark is saying, pop-up exhibits. And, you know, you just have to keep doing it, you know, and, get get somebody to write about it and get it in the Boston Review or the Brooklyn Rail or something and you know and then maybe in the Globe and you know other places maybe art for you know just but you really have to work at it that's why you know people usually that's why the artist doesn't always do that you know the people who do that are the ones who know who are in that world who who run the galleries and run the museums and know who the critics are know whom to contact to get Right. to get publicity um but you can i mean yeah. you can do yeah. it and start talking to people who've done that and find out yeah pardon my know. ignorance but this might be the occasion I'm, i don't know what a pop-up uh, is in this context it's, well, it's a, just a, a thing it, uh, that just pops up and it's not never intended to be permanent right mark i mean yeah i mean it can it depends on the context but you you basically yeah. find a space and that somebody's willing to sort of make available to you and it can run anywhere from a several days to about a week. Yeah. Uh, and I've or seen more. exhibits yeah. that way or, or more, but it's all about organization and, um, you know, and sort of uh, the financial onus obviously is on, is on you uh, to, to put this together. But at the same time, there are opportunities, you know, to get creative and to, yeah. to create the space for the work. And it, it gives you a certain amount of freedom in terms of publicity yeah. Do this enough times and eventually sort of, you know, word of mouth is really very important also. Right. And but how does it come to people's attention, the pop-up? Uh, one thing I wonder, um, in in New York, there are buildings that are, that are mostly artist studios and they mm-hmm. advertise open studios. And I mean, obviously, uh, it, a space that showed your mother's paintings wouldn't be a working studio. But if you could figure out how to get a space to fill with her work uh, in one of these buildings where people were coming through for mm. open studio- studios because people just look in, you know, every open door mm. and talk to whoever's there and look at the work. Um, and, you know, that that's one way they would learn. I mean, it just ha- you just have to figure out how to get it out there. I mean, people don't necessarily go from, you know, painting in their little s- studio to suddenly showing in a museum or even a gallery. There's a lot of steps in between of bringing the work to to notice and to the notice of people who can make some of these things happen um or people who know people who can make some of these things happen so and it's and it can be very gratifying i mean somebody can come into your pop-up space and say oh i just love that um you know i want to buy it and i want to help you and you know i want to see more you know and that's that's a big um you know, big shot in the arm for you, you know, and that person can have suggestions. So anyway, yeah. If, yeah I can interject. It's a little bit like a, uh, a happening from the 60s and early 70s. And yeah. you're sort of crazy. <laughs> but minus the drugs and all that stuff. But it's basically a, uh, a spontaneous, you know, it's, it's viewed as a spontaneous event, but it also mm-hmm. requires a certain amount of networking. Mm-hmm. And, um and there's a, you know, there, there. I think there are possibilities out there. You just, you yeah, just me too. Get, uh, you know, creative, and um, and you know, you'll, you know, you, you probably will find somebody who's willing to sort of lend the space, um, you know, for like a one or two or three day event, and uh, and publicize it. And you do enough of these, and then eventually the work gets around, and then this seems to be critical mass because it's the way everything else works. You know, the more you hear, then the more you think it's valid. So mm-hmm. it's really silly. But um, but that's how people function and react. You know, mm-hmm. they, 
if something is constantly coming back and being exhibited from one place to the next, then people think, oh my God, she's important. I mean, I'm being silly, but not being silly because I've seen this happen way too yeah. much. What about, are there Christmas markets sort of pop, popping up around Boston? I mean, maybe you could find one of those spaces for a while. I would say more than three days, Mark. I don't think that's enough. I think it'd have to be at least well, a week. But. Pop-ups, that, that's the nature of a pop-up. It's anywhere, it's whatever you can Whatever do. you can, yeah. Yeah. A John maybe, hand up, and we, we only have about seven to eight more minutes. I, I'd like to have about uh, 30 seconds. Uh, to say that I've never heard the term pop-up, but we've certainly visited the pop-up exhibits here in Paris. There are plenty of places with space to rent for the moment because of the peculiar circumstances we're living in. And uh, the paintings are on the wrong side of the Atlantic, but uh, nevertheless, it's something not to be given thought to. Uh, uh, we've, we've gone to pop-ups for artists we didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, Victor, would you like, to, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Uh, would you like to uh, say anything as we move on to the rest of our long weekend? Uh, well, I'm really grateful. US, to you. By the way, that's uh, <laughs> the, the long weekend is here in the U.S. Go yeah. ahead. Victor. I'm really grateful to you, Michael, for suggesting this in the first place and for, for doing it. And I'm, very happy to see all of you here. I, I'd like to give a shout out to Milton Fisk uh, because he also set an example for me. Milton Fisk, his father was a notable American artist named Edward Fisk, uh, whose work some of you may know. And uh, every year Milton would send Christmas cards with a, a photo of one of his father's paintings on the card. And that's uh, an, it been an inspiration to me as well. And uh, and uh, Mark, uh, thank you also, especially for your participation in the discussions we've been having about precisely the whole project of extending uh, recognition of, of my mother's work. And, and uh, anyone else who's interested in Patricia, uh, who's on here also, she's the scholar from Austria who got in touch with me and who sparked some of this uh, work, especially to disclose the information about what the Nazis did to the work in Paris. So thank you, Patricia, for that. And I'm glad you joined us now. And we, I'm, I'm happy that this will be uh, available as a recorded video to send to those who couldn't come to this event. But I'm so grateful to all of you who did come. And I thank you for joining us and, and will welcome any suggestions uh, about what we might do to to advance this project and I, I'm glad to think of it as being part of a uh, of a wider agenda of of uh, let's say preserving the species let's uh, to put it in the most general way that, that uh, I think everybody can uh, embrace so thanks again and that's I'm happy with this thank you Victor now, may, has your hand up. Oh, may I, hand may is I, up. Yes, yeah, of thank, course. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Victor. I thought it was really, really interesting. And as far as I can, I can only confirm for me, it's work in progress. And we will be talking about many possibilities. And you know what I'm doing. And that will surely be assisting um, that if there's a pop-up, there will be some background uh, in, in writing about your mother. Yes, I should mention by way of explanation that Patricia is actually writing a master's thesis about Diane Esmond. And that, mm. that was a big breakthrough to have someone who would have that level of interest in, in her work. So it's been a big encouragement. Thank you, Patricia. You're welcome. I, I want to say that before this event, I had said to Victor, this really needs to have a few minutes of no regulation, like after any type of gallery show or going to a museum with friends, I'm leaving the Zoom channel open. We'll cut it out of the edited uh, recording if you like, but if people want to sit and talk to one another, we did that after our morning event and we uh, had an, some nice conversations. So Victor, I'm, I'm thanking you for your presentation for your online exhibit. It was very moving. In fact, incredible. I, I'm, 
the images are still going through uh, my my uh, my consciousness, even though I worked a bit with two of the paintings in doing promotions for this. So, and I thank everyone for coming to have such a good afternoon of this uh, Friday, the twenty sixth of November.